takes you the Ten Commandments. And uh, as we move along from Exodus chapter 20 there to that list, I've wondered at times if they are given in order of importance. You know, if you only can obey one, get this one, and then down the line, or if that's not the case, if maybe they're given in a different order because in that order for a different reason. I don't know, but uh, as we last week looked at honoring our father and our mother, uh, this week we look at you shall not murder. Since the fall of man in the garden, physical violence against fellow human beings is a given. There is probably no greater evidence of human rebellion against God's moral law than the premeditated murder of humans. War, state terrorism, premeditated murder have characterized human history. But the causation of this is difficult, this kind of violence, difficult to explain. The murder of human beings, either individually or in a mass murder setting, is perplexing. Many people attempt to attribute human violence to the economy, to poverty, to living conditions, things like that. But in a sense, none of these explanations truly explain the question of why. Why does that people do that? Many killing sprees are driven by grudges, desire for revenge. The victims are bosses and co-workers and family members or fellow students such as Virginia Tech and Columbine High School. Some attacks are driven by political ideology and can properly be described as terrorism. Mass murder is on the increase. Between 1976 and 2010, the United States experienced 645 mass murder events. That's the killing of at least four victims. The total kill during this period is 2,949 people. And we just had an event, you know, like the last couple of days, so it just keeps going on. Consider the tragedy and atrocity of the 24-year-old James Holmes. Clad in body army, armor and armed with several guns, Holmes killed, what was it, 12 people and injured 58 others, wounded them with bullets in a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, which was showing the movie The Dark Knight Rises. He dyed his hair a weird orange and told the police, I am the Joker, one of the figures in the Batman story. Was he living out the Batman movie as a, as a Joker? For most of us, it's impossible to conceive of someone such as James Holmes who did something so horrific. Therefore, we refer to him as a monster or we think of him as having mental illness. We like to hand out these labels so we can think he's not like us. We could never do something like that. But of course we could because everyday people just like us doing their jobs were taking care of the death camps. As we long for explanations for such evil, we quickly conclude there's no educational, psychological or political solution to this evil. Evil is fundamentally irrational. It simply cannot be grasped by means of our intellectual categories. We don't have thinking processes that set up for that. Evil is a very denial of rationality. Well, the future for murder in America is great. All the leading indicators are up. Homicide is at a new height. Suicide is up too, especially among teens. It is tripled in number. More children are dying at the hands of their abusive parents. Feticide, the killing of fetuses, is booming. If we keep going a few more years at the present rate, we will have aborted 60 million babies. That is 10 times the number of people killed in Germany's death camps. Road rage and drive-bys make the simple things of life a risk. Of course, we're appalled. Uh, our politicians, educators, preachers <laughs> decry all the violence. 
No previous age has equaled our horror of killing. But then no previous age has killed so much. Where do we turn? Well, for the Christian, it is to God's word and the healing light of the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. If we understand and obey this word from God, we will enjoy grace in our souls and healing in our world. There are some questions that we can ask of Scripture that will help us understand and be challenged to find that special grace in our lives from God. First question, where, when can life be taken? When can life be taken? The sixth commandment in Hebrew consists of just two words, no killing. The King James Version said, you shall, says you shall not, thou shalt not kill. The most uh, versions translate it, you shall not murder. Murder is a more accurate translation. This prohibits the blowing away of a personal enemy. No murder. Some have ignored this understanding and have argued that this commandment forbids all forms of taking human life under any circumstance. But that's an impossible translation because other parts of the law of Israel list 18 crimes listed for the death penalty, including murder, child sacrifice, kidnapping, incest, adultery, witchcraft, etc. Obviously, there are some situations in which it is appropriate to take human life. Let me list some possibilities. Number one, capital punishment. In Bible times, capital punishment was an acceptable means of law enforcement. In fact, God ordered capital punishment long before Moses. He said to Noah right after the flood in Genesis 9-6, Whoever shed, sheds the blood of man, my man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made man. And our Lord Jesus, nowhere in his teachings, set aside the death penalty. I would conclude that capital punishment should be viewed as an option of human government to be used sparingly in cases of premeditated murder with no mitigating factors and with certain proof. Second thing, possibility, law and order. In addition to capital punishment, God has given human government the right to use appropriate force, which may at times include killing to uphold its laws. In Romans 13, where Paul develops a relationship between government and the state, uh, he, the governing authorities are given the right to use the sword. In Romans 13, 4, it says, if you do wrong, be afraid. For he, the government minister, the uh, leader, does not bear the sword for nothing, for he is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. And the sword here refers to the government's power over life and death. Then number three, there's war. There is no doubt that war is terrible and degenerating. I have been interested in the American Civil War. I have read a lot. I've watched a lot of cable documentaries and those horrible battles. So many times troops would storm impossible positions again and again, becoming cannon fodder for the defending guns. Not only soldiers suffered, but also civilians were murdered, raped, and pillaged. I watched an account of the Battle of Stalingrad, which took place in World War II. Thousands and thousands of Russian and German troops suffered and died in that prolonged battle. Hitler did some terrible things to many people, but he caused the death and suffering of so many of his own people. Germans died by the thousands because he pridefully and he wouldn't listen to his generals. He made stupid mistakes. War is about the worst thing that man does. Yet sometimes war is valid for the Christian. And though there are few just wars, there are some that are justifiable. A just war is a defensive war. A just war should have at least seven distinctions 
And I quote those who have developed a philosophy on this. There should be a just cause, just intention, last resort, formal declaration, limited objectives, proportionate means, and protection for innocent citizens. Participation in the use of force is something every Christian needs to think about prayerfully and carefully. But I'm convinced if it is a just cause, a Christian may be led to be a soldier. The fourth area of consideration would be self-defense. Self-defense. I'm convinced that offering protection from those who are purposefully harming others is not murder. The examples in the Bible and the principles it teaches tell me that if you come after my family and me, I am free to stop you. Just over a few chapters in Exodus chapter 22, verse 2, it says, If a thief is caught in the act of breaking into a house and is killed in the process, the person who killed the thief is not guilty. Well, if we stop there and only note these four ways in which the commandment you shall not murder allows for the taking of life, we would miss the main thrust of this sixth commandment. The main thrust of this commandment is the preciousness of human life. The preciousness of human life. That's the emphasis of this commandment. So the second question we ask is, why is murder forbidden? And this passage that I referred to in Genesis 9-6 gives us the principle, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made man. You can go over to the beach and you can wander up and down our beautiful Oregon coast and see all the beauty. Every turn in the road gives you a new vista. I mean, like someone coming from Iowa out here and driving up and down our Oregon coast, you have to have gone without that kind of beauty to really appreciate it. Maybe you native Oregonians don't appreciate it as much, but it is absolutely beautiful. Or you could go take the drive down the gorge through 75 miles of the most beautiful scenery that you could drive maybe anywhere in the world. These are wonders of God's handiwork. But when you see that, that is not God's chief work. Consider a newborn baby, eyes and mouth wide open, arms reaching for some kind of life. Uh, that is the height of God's creation. Now, why would I say that? A baby is a physical wonder. Its mind is an amazing computer recording virtually everything it experiences. Its eyes pass on incredible amounts of data. Uh, first through the cornea, then the lens, and then that light flows to the retina, where there are 125 million nerve endings, and it strikes those simultaneously. This is processed by millions of microswitches and funneled down the optic nerve, which contains one million separate insulated fibers. They have to be insulated so they don't short circuit. And when the information reaches the brain, an equally complex process begins, and all of that takes place in a millisecond. Just a flash. All of that is done. That is amazing. But far beyond the physical wonder is the fact that a baby is made in the image of God. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Thank you, Abby, for reminding us that you're here. That little baby is not only a body, but it is an eternal soul. The newborn baby has, despite its sin nature, a delicate moral sensitivity and a mind-boggling possibilities of achievement. Man is without any kind of uh, rival. He is the apex 
of God's creation. No angel can rival him. Why? Well, angels are not made in the image of God. Therefore, murder is, the most intense sense of the word, a sacrilege. A sacrilege. It is not only a crime against mankind, it is a crime against God in whose image man and women are made. Why is murder forbidden? Because we're made in the image of God, therefore all of life is sacred. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. We are under divine obligation to love our neighbor's life as much as we cherish our own flesh. Your life is sacred. My life is sacred. Your parking lot attendant's life is sacred. Our president's life is sacred. Mitt Romney's life is sacred. Equal billing here. The sacredness of life is at the root of all godly ethics. That's why homicide and all the other sides are wrong. Patricide, matricide, fratricide, sororicide, genocide, suicide. They're all wrong and they're all forbidden. Yes, even suicide is violence against the image of God. And those who present suicide as an option are guilty of great sin. To make the ending of one's life legal in Oregon is a violation of God's law. Most certainly, fetricide, abortion, is a direct sin against God and the preciousness of humankind. Each individual is very remarkable beginning at the moment of conception. The moment that fertilization has taken place, a new human being has come into being and it's no longer a matter of taste or opinion. It is a fact. Virtually all scientists agree that zygotes, fertilized eggs, embryos, and fetuses are human individuals. And the controversy has moved from the question of when life begins to the question of the value of life at various stages. And God says all human life is precious. You shall not murder is a profound word of grace because it is called to be a lover of all humanity from conception to the grave. It involves all of our ethical action. It is not only about harmful taking of life, but existing conditions that threaten life, such as unhealthy pleasures, careless laws, unsafe environments, and insufficient health care. It becomes our commitment to preserve human life from all forms of killing. In this day, when the future for murder is so excellent, what shall we do? Where does action for us begin? Well, the answer is in the heart. That's where it starts, in the heart. We need to pray and in some cases take action against murder in all its forms, but it starts when we look at life as God sees it, when we understand that we are all image bearers and that life is precious. When we understand that, we're going to be moved to godly action. Now let's make it more personal, since probably none of you have killed anybody. Number three question. How do Christians break this commandment? Will you turn with me to Matthew chapter 5? Matthew chapter 5. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's page 1502. Matthew chapter 5, page 1502 and verse 21. Verse 21, you know that this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is up there setting forth his declaration of what life is about. And part of what he does is make a restatement, a redefinition of the Ten Commandments. Look at verse 23, Matthew 5, verse 23. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar... Oh, excuse me. Let's go back 21. Wrong place. Read 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, 
will be in danger of the fire of hell. Jesus gives no quarter in this, as he explains the sixth commandment. He says that those who are guilty of contemptuous anger are guilty enough to go to hell. Now, we need to let that truth sink in. To call someone in the Aramaic word, racha, is literally to call him empty head. We might say numbskull or nitwick or blockhead or bonehead or jerk or idiot. That might be terms that we would use. To address a person in this way demotes the person to the level of nothing. It makes them a nobody. The term fool is from the Greek word moros which we get our word moron. But this had nothing to do with the person's IQ. Uh, these two words, they, it was used for people who denied God's existence. They were evil people. And these two words together expressed contempt for an individual's head, heart, and character. These were words of malignant, hateful contempt. And Jesus condemns such expressions because they show contempt for individuals who are made in the image of God. It's a way to show contempt for God. Jesus says such murderous attitudes can land someone in hell. You see, when you're saying you're a nobody, you're saying to God that your image is nothing. That's showing big contempt for God. We are not safe just because we haven't shed blood. We're guilty enough to receive punishment if we have harbored anger and contempt. If you wish someone was dead, your heart has known murder. So, how do Christians break this commandment? Writing off another person shows our contempt for God. When we put it this way, we realize we're all murderers. We've all murdered others in mind and our heart. We've had thoughts about others that are as foul as murder. Now, this is strong language, but it's loving because it's designed to drive us to the end of ourselves so we'll turn to God in His grace. No one perfectly measures up. We're all lawbreakers. But God's grace can come into our lives and He can change us. By the power of His Spirit, we can love others instead of hating them and wishing they were dead. What our world needs are those who truly love God and then are able to love others. Those who will then see in us that cherishment of others uh, and realize that we're committed to their best interests. Our friends will find that the love we offer in Jesus Christ is very inviting, like a cool drink in a parched land. They will want to know the one who changed us and charged us with his love. How can this person be so loving when people do these bad things? We'll become fountains of grace in God's name. I think of Mark and Laura Hefner. As they work in Taiwan, they joyously reach out to everyone. Every person is important to God. And we've been praying for the guard at their community gate. Mark gave him some materials and a copy of the Bible to read. So we've been praying that that man will read the Bible and he will come to faith. That needs to be our lifestyle. We love everyone and we reach out to them for Jesus. Everyone is important. Everyone needs Jesus. That's how we treat them. So question number four which, what action of obedience shall we take? Now we want to read with verse 23. Therefore, if you are offering your grace at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. We're guilty of inwardly transgressing the sixth commandment, 
And if that's true, we're to take immediate action. Our Lord gives us a little picture to help us understand. As the worshiper entered the great temple of Herod uh, with his sacrifice, he would pass through the different courts. There's the court of the Gentiles, the court of women, then there's the court of the men, and now before him lies the court of the priests, where only priests could pass. And here he is with his sacrifice, ready to confess his sins, and he remembers he's wronged his brother. And his conscience is just throbbing. So he whirls, he retreat, retreats through the great courts, and he goes to find this brother. Jesus' point. It's more important to be reconciled to a brother than to fulfill a religious duty. Look at verse 24. It says, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Do it now. See, if we put it off, we may never act. Our dark century needs hearts of grace now. If God is speaking to you about an action that you need to take to ask forgiveness of an individual, will you tell God right now, I will do it today? Will you tell God that? I will do it today. Don't put it off. And when you do that, you'll be reconciled not only to your brother, but to God. And that's treating someone with love rather than hate. When he was two years old, Wayne, the youngest of three children, was abandoned by his father. Unable to support her three boys, his mother turned them over to the state. The boys spent most of their childhood in various foster homes. And the few facts that Wayne knew about his father were very negative. He was a troubled man who drank excessively, physically abused his wife, was chronically unemployed, and spent time in various jails and prisons. As Wayne grew up, his anger to his, toward his father grew to hatred. In the 1970s, Wayne learned that his father had died and was buried in New Orleans. So he decided to go down there and see what was happening. He stood over his father's grave and he wanted to scream at his dead father, Why didn't you love me and take care of me and my mother? Why were you so mean and selfish? I hate you. That's what he wanted to say. But rather than letting that anger rage in a way, in a one-way conversation, he said to his father, I forgive you. The time has come for me to abandon this anger. I have carried around my anger for you so painfully long. But right now, all of that is gone. I forgive you. And Wayne walked from the cemetery in peaceful, emotional tranquility. His family life improved dramatically. His act of forgiveness provided immediate positive personal and professional benefits. He soon wrote his first book, The Million Seller, Your, Seller, Your Erroneous Zones. Wayne W. Dreyer went on to write other bestsellers and has appeared on hundreds of television shows and he speaks to conventions all around the world built around that big idea of forgiveness and the results of it. He said in his book, you'll see it when you believe it, the way to personal transformation. This is what he wrote. He said, it all began there standing in that damp cemetery in Louisiana. The willingness to forgive is the ultimate sign of personal maturity and social responsibility. The act of forgiveness is an indispensable key to emotional health. Forgiveness is the only way to make peace with the past, create joy in the present, and to build hope in the future. It is Jesus' prescription for writing relationships. Now let's talk about what action we can take this week. Action we can take this week, number five in the back of your sermon note sheet, you shall not murder is a positive call to cherish our neighbors because they're made in the image of God. Maybe we don't cherish our neighbors because we don't love God. If you don't love God, you probably aren't, don't care about your neighbors. 
But loving God is the key to loving others. Pray and ask God to increase your love for him and then for others. Take public responsibility for doing all you can to prevent the occurrence of taking life through homicide, suicide, infanticide, or any other kind. Get out of the Get out into the community. Be salt and light wherever you go. Support pregnancy resource centers. Open your home. Consider foster care and adoption. Write letters. Vote intelligently. Consciously befriend a lonely person. Talk to another about what can be done. Uh, I have been more and more in our community, working with others, realizing that if you can think of something to do, somebody has probably already got uh, some kind of ministry or program or something going on out there that you could be part of. Uh, we have an amazing awareness in our city and especially in our community of working together to be a help. And uh, there's so many things you can do. You shall not murder forbids hateful thoughts. We cannot invite people to Jesus while we entertain hatred for others. Do you have thoughts about certain people? I suggest you just take time alone and write them down. The persons that you have problems with. And then read Ephesians 4, 25 to 32. Note that we are to forgive as we have been forgiven in Christ. How are you forgiven in Christ? Because that person comes up and asks you to forgive him? Because you deserve to be forgiven? No. He just forgave us. He died on that cross. We didn't ask him to. We weren't smart enough to. And did we deserve it? No, it's all by grace. It's a grace gift to us. So that's how we're to forgive others. Not because they ask for it, not because they deserve it, not because we can somehow make them sweat out for their bad thing they did to us and punish them back, but we just forgive them because Christ forgave us. If we sense that forgiveness in us, we can offer it to others. Uh, ask God to forgive you for your feelings about people on that list and enable you to love them. If you've wronged them in word or deed, go to them, confess your wrong, ask them to forgive you. That decision of forgiveness can be the watershed of grace flowing into your life. It can be that healing thing that can make the difference in your life. So, offer that forgiveness. Get it right. Stop the hate. Begin to love. And... Stop murdering people because you wish they were dead. Find forgiveness for that. And honor Jesus Christ by your open love for people. Pray with me. Our God, we, we thank you for the wonderful gift of forgiveness. We don't have to hate. We don't have to act in vengeance. We can just forgive people. We can let it go like you let it go, all of our sin, all of our wrong. And we thank you that that can heal our hearts. We can turn to a positive person. We can take away that hate and we can show your love to other people. We pray that you will give us that gift in our lives. And if we have something against someone today, today we will go. And we will make it right with that person. We will ask her forgiveness and find forgiveness. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.